The story that we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 10 in our continuous study and breaking down this chapter is very simple if you'll listen to it. It is revolutionary in your life. It will change your impact on your family and it very much may allow you to finally heal from something that has hurt you and broken you down for, cent for generations and years and years today. The phrase, God is looking for you. It is a statement that I have made so often to so many people. The very first time I said it, though, took place somewhere around 2008. I was pastoring a church in Livonia, and one of our members owned a limousine service. And one week he came up to me and said, Pastor, as a gift to you, I want to give you a limo free wherever you go. And I said, OK, great. And so what we did is we took that free limo and we went to, don't listen, Mom, we went to a concert for John Bon Jovi at the Palace of Auburn Hills. And so we got in the vehicle and we drove and it was a you know really cool limo and everything. Free is, you can't beat free. Even if it wasn't great, free is better than nothing. And so we drove all the way from Westland. And so we got that part you know, on 24, coming around that big ramp and listening and talking to the driver. And he, he was talking with somebody on a walkie talkie and he said, ah, oh, one of our other limos is broken down on the ramp. And I said, well, why don't you just let them get in with us? We're both going to the concert at the palace, why not? And he said, you do that? I said, sure, no problem. He knew I was his boss's pastor and he knew. So I wanted to be a good Samaritan, right? So we stop and we let this couple get in. What, what gets in the limos is, was fascinating. First, it was a little bit older than me at that time, probably about 45 year old, beautiful blonde lady, all right? Uh, wearing an outfit she shouldn't be wearing, but she was still a beautiful blonde lady. And she gets in the vehicle with what I think the Greek word to describe him is punk. That's the word. He was a complete and total punk, about 23, 25, wearing enough cologne that would fill this room. And he had two beers in his hands and he was trying to drink them as fast as he could before he got in it. So they got in. So it was obvious this was a date. And so we start talking a little bit and I kind of ask him, we were stuck in that traffic. So we were in the vehicle for like 15 minutes, just enough time, right? And so we're in this vehicle and I asked him well, what he does. Well, at that time, you remember Detroit was building casinos. And he said, I'm a representative for one of the casinos and I'm here doing the preliminary work of getting the casino built and set up and everything. And he's telling me the whole thing. Well, at that point, you always know, I know it's coming. And you know this, if you ask one person uh, what they do for a living, what are they gonna do? They're gonna turn around and ask you. So he's just explained this with two beers in his hand. This is obviously some sort of hookup date. And he's telling me about how he starts casinos. And he says, what do you do? And I said, well, my job is to make sure that you fail. And he looked at me like some of you are looking at me. I kind of laughed. I said, actually, I'm a Baptist preacher. And the lady who really wasn't paying much attention turned ghost white. And she said, are you kidding me? I said, yeah. She said, and she started to tell me the story that when she was a kid, there was a bus that came by and picked her up. And she started going to a Baptist church and she said, I went to this thing. I don't know if you have it called Awana. And I said, oh, I know Awana. We have Awana at our church. It's an amazing ministry. It's wonderful. And she started telling me this story that she had two girls about eight, 10 or so at home. And she had just recently got divorced and everything that she was going through and all this. And she said, I need to get back in church. It's been so long and I know it's missing. And I know Jesus would be disappointed in me and the choices and decisions I've been making lately. And she said, I just don't know if I could ever go back and be forgiven. And that's when I reached over, grabbed one of her hands and said, God is looking for you. It is not a coincidence that your vehicle broke down and you got inside a limo of a Baptist preacher. God is looking for you and he wants you. And he has brought me here to tell you that. Now at this moment, I looked over at this guy and if looks could kill, I would have been dead because he was so mad because he could see his entire night was coming to an end what he had planned. And before we got to the palace, we prayed with her and I said, find a good Baptist church, find a good church that preaches the word of God, find anybody who will point you to Jesus because God is looking for you. It's amazing how many times this summer, this last summer and this last year, I've had that opportunity to tell people, God is looking for you. If you're taking notes today, our one simple truth is this, that is not my PowerPoint. Our one simple truth is God will bring people to you to help. God will bring people to you to help. In Luke chapter 9, 
the gifted, the elite, have rejected Jesus' call. They had all these reasons why. They were too busy. They had too much money to be concerned with. As a student pastor, when I was at Faith Baptist and we were seeing all these kids get saved and everything, I would always remind the kids that had grown up at that church who had grandparents who would save. I would always say, you see these kids that have just come in and are saved and on fire for God? You know why they're here? They're here to replace you. They're here to replace you because some of you have refused to answer the call of God on your life and God has brought somebody else here. God has given you a call and if you refuse to do it, God will bring someone else. That is part of the, the lesson of the Good Samaritan. Two other people had a call of God on their life to help someone. They refused and God went to the least of these. God went to those that were rejected and despised. The Samaritans fulfilled this calling. In Luke 9, the gifted, the talented, the superstars of Christianity have walked away from the calling of God and now we come in Luke 10 to the 70. They weren't special. They weren't talented. All they did was simply say yes. And they were sent to tell people that Jesus was coming. They came back rejoicing. Now look how Jesus describes. He said, Pastor, I think you're maybe being too harsh on these 70 and you're, you're undercut. Okay, look what Jesus describes them. Look at verse 21 of Luke 10. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, and thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. That's the Luke 10. That's the Luke 9 group. You didn't use this. You didn't use the wise, the prudent, the talented. And who? And has revealed them unto babes. Now, that's not lingo that you might want to hear when you're a 17 year old girl. That's not that type of babe. This is a child. This is an immature. This is a untalented person. Look, babies are wonderful, aren't they? But babies, all they do is take and take and take. And you'll be lucky at one point if they give you that smile of recognition or they grab onto your finger and you think, oh, this is great. I'll put up with the four o'clock feedings. I'll put up with the multiple diapers that are disgusting. I'll put up with all of this because this little thing that looks like me smiled back at me. But babies are basically useless. Amen. Don't leave me on this island alone. And that's how Jesus describes the 70. You use these babies. Why? So, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Ministry is limited. It's limited by three things. It's, Pastor Chief, I just want to, I want to minister. I want to help somebody. I want, oh, that's a great. It's, your ministry will be limited by three things. It'll be limited by your bias. Racism is ugly. One of the reasons why I am very anti-abortion, if that's the terminology, I like pro-life. But one of the reasons why is because of the ugly racist history of abortion. But that ugly racism has often slipped into the church. There are no white churches. There are no black churches. There are no Hispanic churches. There are nothing like that. If you are a black church, you are not a church of God. If you are a white church, you are not a church that Jesus called and designed. There is no, there is no Greek. There is no Gentile. At the foot of the cross, we are all equal. We are nothing more than sinners that need a savior. Amen. Your ministry is limited by your bias. Your ministry is limited by the time. The greatest resource you have is time and you spend it arguing with people on Facebook. Your ministry is limited by your priorities. When I was a young student pastor in Texas, I contacted, I was put in contact with a church looking for someone. And I talked with this, this I have no problem naming this church. They don't exist and they probably shouldn't have existed. Peachtree Baptist Church in Mesquite, Texas. I don't think they exist anymore. I've looked them up. And I contacted this man and he said, well, we don't want a student pastor. We would want you to be an activities director. And I said, well, why? Well, we've come to the conclusion as a group of, as a church that we've got about 10 teenagers and that's enough. And our fear is if we get a student pastor in here, you might do too good of a job and get too many kids because we really don't want any more kids. We like the balance and the size that we are at. I might tell you that size does not determine the hand of God. But that type of attitude, that type of priority, that certain people are more important than others is from the pit of hell. Amen? Amen. Today, we come to a famous parable and a misunderstood parable. The Good Samaritan. It has been used today for social justice. This is why we need to be all about these causes and these movements. This is, this is about voters' rights. Uh, this is about feeding the, uh, the, uh, the homeless and the poor. This is about building hospitals. This is about, no, no, no. That is wrong. 
It is not about feeding the homeless. It is not about sheltering people. It is not about making sure people get vaccines or, or anything else like that. That is wrong. There's two things I want you to understand about this. All parables focus on Jesus. Jesus is the focus of every one of his parables. In the story of, uh, of the prodigal son, Jesus is the father in that parable. And he is the one waiting for the son to come back to him. He is the one trying to convince the good son that never left, who was the religious son, that he too needs to repent. Jesus is the focus of every parable and all parables are about salvation. That's the whole point of all parables is Jesus and salvation. By the way, that's what all churches are supposed to be about. That's where the name comes from, Cross Creek, because the cross represents Jesus and what he did on the cross for you. And the creek, whether you voluntarily do it or involuntarily baptize, the creek represents that next public statement of taking your faith public and declaring, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. Every parable you read should focus on Jesus. By the way, every doctrine of a church should focus on Jesus. Every ministry of a church should focus on Jesus. Yeah, it's children's ministry, but why does it exist? It exists not to be a lure to get other people to come to your church, like your Walmart trying to have a multi-faction at one shop all for church. No, it should exist because you want to see boys and girls come to know Christ as their Savior. Amen? Senior citizens ministry should exist. Why? Because you want to help seniors grow in their faith and come closer to Jesus. And if they don't know Christ as their personal savior, give them an opportunity. Everything a church does, every doctrine, every ministry should be focused on Jesus and salvation. If it doesn't, why do you exist? So today we're going to break down this passage. Maybe I'll calm down. There we go. You're taking notes. We're going to look at Luke 10, 25 through 37 today. We're just going to break it down in outline form. Why? I don't know. I just felt like it. First of all, we're going to see a missed opportunity. Look at verse 25. Here he has, he has Jesus in front of him. Behold, a certain lawyer. It's not a lawyer like you think of, like Sam Bernstein. That's not the type of lawyer. It's somebody who studied the Old Testament and the word of God. Okay. And stood up, tempted him, important word, saying, master, he didn't mean that. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is a great question. Isn't this the question the rich young ruler said coming up to Jesus? What do I have to do? Isn't this the question that Nicodemus in John chapter 3 asked Jesus also? And Jesus repeatedly said, believe on me. This is a perfect question to ask Jesus because Jesus is salvation. He is all of it wrapped up in him. Salvation is that you are a sinner separated from God and could do nothing about it. And Jesus died in your place. And if you accept him as your savior, if you accept him as your place, you too can be born again, John chapter three. You too can be forgiven, John chapter four. You too can go to heaven and live with Jesus forever. But he didn't ask it looking for an answer. What does it say there in verse 25? And tempting him. The saddest person in hell is not Hitler. Adolf Hitler knew when he pulled that trigger where he was going. He wasn't surprised. I'm not trying to be light of the matter and, and in any level of his horrible story, but he didn't pull the trigger and go, oh my Lord, I'm in, I'm in hell. I can't believe this. No, he wasn't shocked. The saddest person in hell is the person who sat in a good Bible preaching church, who heard the gospel week after week and even knew what it meant and never accepted and received Jesus as their savior. So here's Jesus's response to him. Verse 26. And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Okay, he was proud. He knew the answer. This is what he did is nothing but study the law. So you can imagine this man kind of perked up. All right, this is my wheelhouse. Verse 27. And he answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That's important. And he said unto them, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So is this the gospel? Is what Jesus saying here is, is he teaching a work salvation that if you just love your neighbor and love God and you love him as yourself, then you too will go to heaven. Well, Jesus tells him to go and do it. And here's the reason why, because there's a problem with it. He couldn't do it. Basically what, and by the way, you can't do it either. Basically what Jesus is saying here, you want the kingdom of God? Okay. Be perfect. You have to be perfect in everything you do. And that is what the law was about. The law was a mirror showing you that you were imperfect. And then grace stepped in and the cross and the blood of Jesus stepped in. See, this man was an insincere seeker. Because what does Jesus repeatedly tell sincere believers? Believe in me. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, not through good works, baptism, church membership. No one comes to the Father except through me. But here's the amazing thing. He's telling him, you will never be good enough. And probably this man never received Jesus, even though he had him face to face. But Jesus still died for him. Roman numeral two in our breakdown. Here's a faulty question. Verse 29. All right. So what does this proud man do? He couldn't leave well enough alone. But he, willing to justify himself, meaning to make himself look better in front of everyone else, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The whole point of Jesus' statement goes right past him. He wants to justify himself. He wants to look good in front of men. This right here in verse 29 and this type of thing, this is religion. Religion is about self-justifying me. If I do certain things, it's man-made garbage. If I pray a certain way, if I make a certain sign, if I do this, then God will forgive me and I will self-justify myself. But you know what else religion is? Religion is about pointless focus. Focusing on the most pointless, ridiculous things. I have seen churches fight and argue over the dumbest things that have nothing to do with anything. I have had people come up to me at churches I pastor and, and complain about the dumbest possible things. It doesn't, look, you know what? It doesn't matter if you're cold and the air condition is too much. There are people dying and going to hell. Amen? It doesn't matter if you don't like the color of the building. It doesn't matter because there's kids of all shapes and colors who need Jesus. Religion focuses on the dumbest possible things. And this is what he does. Well, who is my neighbor? Oh, hello, McFly. You just missed the whole point. See, Jesus already answered this. Next to verse 29, put Matthew 5, 43 and 44. If you like to put notes in your Bible, Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Jesus answered this. Ye have heard that it was said, meaning the, the Pharisees taught you this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What Jesus already said in Matthew 5 is, who your neighbor is? Everyone. Everyone is your neighbor. Your worst enemy to your best friend. Everyone is your neighbor. And one of the things we're going to touch on, I just want to take a time out here. Some of the, some of the best counseling you'll ever get. Some of the best healing of a hurt and wounded soul you will ever have. Some of the best medicine I could ever give you. And I think it's the best is to take the love that you got from Jesus and give it to the people who hurt you. It will heal you better than anything. It will help you advance. And as we talk about this, I will never say to you, get over something. No, don't ever. That's horrible advice. Get over it. You were, something was horribly done to you. You should just suck it up and get over it. No, I would never say that to you. That is not the biblical advice. But I will say to you is keep moving. Keep moving, keep serving God, keep serving Jesus because Jesus has a plan for everything, even something horrible done to you. So here's the parable in verse 30. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, departing, leaving him half dead. This is random violence. It's not his fault. He didn't do anything. But we will see others are walking this way too. Many have tried to come up with theories and allegorize what this all means, okay? What the point of this is. And they've tried to make this man the nation of Israel to the church and everything else. Let me tell you this. You know what the answer to this is? There isn't an answer to this because this dude doesn't exist. He's not a real person. It's just a story that Jesus is trying to teach. Quit trying to be so smart and find hidden meanings in the word of God and just be dumb and do the simple things that are black and white. Number three, <coughs> a passionless priest, a passionless priest. Look at verse 31. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, this man beaten and left there, he passed on the other side. Why did he do this? Well, there's some, a lot of speculation that Maybe he was on his way to the temple and he didn't want to defy himself. And maybe there's an argument about religion keeping him from helping people. I'd like to give you my opinion of why he did this. And here it is. The reason, he's just a jerk. That's why. 
I don't know what better word to describe somebody who sees somebody beaten, half naked, and left, and about to die, and doesn't stop to help them. In fact, walks all the way around. I think the word jerk is apropos. But Jesus is telling this story, and as he mentions the priest, there are priests in the crowd listening to him. And when he says a priest does this, their ears pick up, and they hear this man and think, he's talking about me. Now, just a side note, there's no such thing as a perfect messenger. All right? There's no such thing as a person who gives the gospel that doesn't have issues and problems. There's no such thing as a perfect messenger. But you can always be a passionate teller. You don't have to be perfect, but you can be passionate about Jesus. Next, a shameless scribe. Look at verse 32. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by the other side. Uh, this man held God's word. He taught God's word, but he could not hold a wounded man. Again, no such thing as a perfect messenger, but we can always be a courteous teller. The lawyer thought, good, I'm in good company. You know, see, these other guys didn't help either. And maybe he's thinking only certain people are our neighbors, right? The priest didn't help and I wouldn't have helped. Now a scribe, part of Le the tribe of Levi, but not Aaron. He, he, he didn't help either. So I must be in good company. Just because you're in a room full of jerks doesn't give you an excuse to be a jerk. Just because you're in a bar doesn't give you an excuse. Maybe don't go to the bar. But just because you're in a room group full of people who are doing the wrong things does not give you an excuse for doing the wrong things. Now, Jesus is going to take this story and completely turn it upside down. What is about to happen is a twist that no one saw coming. So let's look first at a marvelous model. Verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. When Jesus said the word Samaritan, their ears popped up. The Samaritans were mixed group of people. They were half Jews, half Gentiles. When the northern kingdom was carried away before the southern kingdom, they were sort of the Jews that were left. And then the Gentiles came in. They intermarried. They took some of their Judaism, their true Old Testament belief, and they intertwined it with some of the Gentile beliefs. And they, they set up their own temple. And when Israel got a chance to come back after the book of Daniel, they tried to reunite with the Jews that came and the Jews wanted nothing to do with them. They were half, I, I don't want to know if this is the right term, but I'll use it. They were half breeds in their mind. They were mixed people. Their, their faith wasn't right. Everything was wrong. The Jews wanted nothing to do with them. And repeatedly in the, in the third century, the, the Samaritans repeatedly tried to come back together and they wanted nothing more than to be part of the Jews that came. And the Jews hated them. They rejected them. They abused them physically and verbally. Good Jews hated Samaritans. Every group has a group of people they don't like. I have found that to be true. No matter where you go, there's always a group in this country and around the world. Um, you know, for us, it's people from Ohio. Now, sometimes people deserve it. But it is how, that is how they attack Jesus. Our theme verse for today is John 8, 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Saw we not well that thou art a Samaritan that has a devil. That's how they insulted Jesus, by calling him simply a Samaritan. Now watch, watch how much this man puts into this wounded man. He puts two things. First, he gave his time. Look at verse 34. And went to him and bound his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. This is stuff he would have carried with him and set him on his own beast. Remember, the most precious thing you have is your time. But look, he also gave his money in verse 34 and brought him to an inn. I, I wondered if Jesus, when he told this part, came to the word inn, maybe thought of his own story of his birth in Luke chapter two, of there not being, I don't know. All I know is this is not, you know, the holiday inn. This is not a fancy place. It's not a place in our Western standards you would ever spend a night and took care of him. And when he had to leave in verse 35 and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave to him the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. He gave them basically the two pence. He gave them a month's worth of pay 
to take care of him. And then he also does this. He gives him a blank check. Here's two months. Here's a month's worth of pay. That's a pretty good amount of money. You keep this and whatever you need, you take out of it. And I'm going to trust you that you're going to do the right thing. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't do that with a hotel. I wouldn't do that with an innkeeper. I wouldn't say, here, you write yourself a check and you tell me what it's worth. But see, loving your neighbor as yourself, this is what you would do for you. You would do this for you. Spare no expense if you needed to be taken care of. If you were on death's door, you would do this for you. You would do this for your family. If they came to you and said, we need to do this operation on your grandchild and, or on your daughter, but it's going to cost some money, you'll say, I will sell my house. I will mortgage everything I have to. You would do this for you. Love someone the way you would love yourself. See, you want to be good enough to go to heaven, right? Then you have to do this. Not once, not one day, not one day a week, not, not a week out of a month. You want to be do this? You have to do this every possible day. And here's the truth. You are not good enough to do this. So number six, a rebuking summary. Look at verse 36. Which now of these three, Jesus asked a question, thinkest thou was neighbor to him which fell amongst thieves. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, all right, go and do thou likewise. The proper response to this, I can't do this. Like the proper response to this should have been like the publican of another parable that Jesus told. The publican who beat upon his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He didn't do it. He walked away being self-righteous only. Now let's take a moment to add to this parable my own personal thought. And I want to be careful as I do this not to over-exaggerate what this is about. This parable always focuses on Jesus and the purpose of every parable is salvation. But let's take a moment and think about this parable. The Samaritan had been abused verbally and physically as a Samaritan. His people and himself had been rejected by someone he desperately wanted him to accept. They wanted to be accepted. The Samaritan felt shame. The Samaritan felt second rate. The Samaritan felt abandoned. As I start to go through some of these issues, these are issues so many of you face in this room. These are issues that so many people face. These are some of the toughest issues. It is a lot easier to deal with a wound on your body than it is to deal with a wound on your heart. Now, as I start this, I want to be sensitive because everyone's story is at a different point. What I'm about to say is maybe your story, you're not ready to do this yet. Okay. It's not fair physically. If somebody got wounded, you wouldn't say to them, you know, got hurt and their legs weren't working properly after they had a surgery or whatever. You wouldn't just say, well, get up and walk. You would say, no, no, let's, let's start physical therapy. Let's start exercising. Let's work on this process of getting stronger and better. So maybe in your process of being hurt and wounded, you have not yet reached this point where you can do this. But this should be our goal. When you get ready and you've gotten help to get to this point, I would like to suggest to you that the greatest therapy that you could ever experience is ministering to other people. There is a lesson in the Samaritan and the message is this, as we started off today, Jesus will send people for you to minister and help. But the greatest help you will ever receive for yourself is ministering to someone else and not just doing do gooderism. It is taking the love that Jesus gave you. It is taking the mercy that Jesus gave you and giving it to the people and the, oh, the deepest healing comes when you can do it, not just to a general person. Look, I'm glad you can be merciful to the person who took your spot at Christmas shopping, right? You're in the parking lot and they cut in. And instead of going, you know what? I have more insurance than you and hitting them. You go, all right, I'm going to forgive and give mercy. That's great. That's about the process. But the greatest and the ultimate way you can know you're fully healed or at least in a functioning way is when you can give love and mercy to the direct people who hurt you. So what is my assignment today? And by the way, maybe a little self-focused. What is the way you can start to heal? Number one, limitless love. Hey, hurt people hurt people. 
You've probably heard that before. But forgiven people forgive people. The best way to get through the pain that has been done to you, again, maybe it's after some years of help, right? Maybe you're not there. That's okay. But the best way is to help other people. See, this is not a story about feeding the homeless. This is a story about salvation. And what would Jesus do today? Jesus would tell us to love our enemies. He would say, love the Russians. He would say, love the Taliban, love Al Qaeda, love your neighbor who blows his leaves and yard waste into your yard. He would say, love with a limitless love. Look, how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them about Jesus? How much do you have to hate someone not to tell them they are a sinner destined for hell? Limitless love. Number two, if you're taking notes, maximum mercy. You need the maximum mercy. You in your own situation, you want mercy when you screw up. To go to heaven, you need maximum mercy. The story goes of a very nice church-going man who did well by his family and was a good man, everyone thought. And he dies and goes to heaven and he stands, this is a story, by the way, it's a joke. He stands there, it's not theology, he stands at the pearly gates and there's St. Peter, you know, like all stories about it. And he says, I want to go into heaven. He said, well, that's great. Uh, you have to have a hundred points to make it to heaven. And the man says, well, I've done pretty good. And he starts to tell him his story. And he said, well, I, I was very faithful to my family. I never cheated on my wife. I was married for 50 years. I, I loved her deeply. I loved my family. I provided for my family. And St. Peter said, that's wonderful. One point. And the man thought, that's only one point? And then the man thought, well, I, I was very general, generous in my community. I, I gave to people in need. I gave to every charity that there was. I, I overextended myself. I gave to my church. I took my pastor to lunch. I did everything you're supposed to do. I donated and helped and volunteered. And I was part of all of these things. And he went on and listed all of the stuff. And St. Peter said, that's great. There's two points. And St. Peter and the man looked at him, St. Peter, and said, this is impossible. I only got two points for the majority of my life. I'll never get 100 points. If I get into heaven now, it'll be by the grace of God. And Peter said, bingo, come on in. You see, you and your life needed the maximum mercy that was available to you. Amen. You need to give it to someone else now. Hurt people hurt people. But forgiven people forgive people. I said at the beginning to many people, it is not a mistake that you are with a Baptist preacher. I have said that so many times this summer. I am amazed at how God has put me in people's lives who I would never have that opportunity this last year of being with. So at work, my previous job, I worked at a place with about 2,000 people on the floor. And in our, in our department area, about 500 people, there was this one lady who always sneezed every morning. And she didn't just touch you, sneeze. She made a production of it. And everyone heard her, and everyone kind of would say, Gesundheit, or God bless you, or something like that. And it was annoying because it was ridiculous. She did not have to sneeze that way. She was doing it to draw attention of five, 600 people to her. And it, it just drew, every time she did it, I would look over at the guy that sat next to me, another Baptist guy, and I would look at him and say, that's ridiculous. Someone should tell her to knock it off. Well, after a course of about eight months, they switched up our group and they moved me to another spot only to be sitting right next to the sneezing lady. Yeah, so every morning I got to hear the loud sneeze, not just hear it, but hear it echo in my ear. I had an opportunity to share Jesus with her, had an opportunity to talk with her. Look, you do not get to choose who you love. You do not get to choose who you give mercy to. You just give it to everyone. Just give them Jesus. Just give them Jesus. That is the meaning of the Good Samaritan. That is the lesson. And maybe in doing that, when you're ready, when you reach that point, maybe in doing that, that is when that old wound can finally start to heal. I've given you a missionary story at the end of this. These are people just like the 70 who have answered, answered the call of Jesus. And they all, none of them were special. They weren't greater, more super Christian than you. They just simply said, here am I, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. One of my all-time favorite missionaries, and he actually came out of Detroit, is Nate Saint. 
Nate Saint was a bush pilot, and he and five other guys, one by the name of Jim Elliott, uh, they had a burden. They were missionaries in, uh, I believe it was Ecuador. And there was a group of tribes people that were living in the Amazon basin in Ecuador, and they were basically cut off. And, and uh, the, the Shell Oil Company was coming in there and drilling for oil in South America, and they were having problems with the tribesmen. The tribesmen didn't want anybody in their area. They would kill these workers. Well, the Shell men wanted permission to go in there and fight and have a military and basically wipe them out. And uh, Nate Saint and his group with Jim Elliott, they started to get a burden for this tribe. And they wanted to go and they helped them. And so they started to fly and they found them on the Amazon base. First, they dropped little presents for them to know that they had well-intentioned, different gifts and stuff that, you know, things that they would see as, hey, we don't mean to hurt you. And eventually they landed there and had a pretty good interaction. They came back and they came back a, a couple days later and landed there, their plane in the Amazon River and went there. And they don't know exactly everything that happened, but basically what happened, all five men of those men who gave their lives to serve Jesus were killed by this tribe. What a horrible thing. Here this man answers the call of God. And by the way, isn't this contrary to everything you're taught on the, 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 the TV preachers? Isn't this contrary to everything? Sometimes people sell Jesus. If you accept Jesus, everything will go great in your life. If you accept Jesus, you will be rich and prosperous. I got news for you. If you accept Jesus and answer the call of Christ in your life, things are going to get worse. Things often will get worse, worse, worse. But let me say this. Jesus will never leave you. You end up in a hospital bed. Jesus is right there next to you. Dr. Jesus is in that hospital with you. You have to declare bankruptcy. Lawyer Jesus is there in that room with you. No matter what you go through, my Savior never leaves you. Nate Saint lost his life. What a horrible thing to do. What a horrible thing to happen. And he had children at home. And if you see that, that, they made a movie about his life, The End of the Spear, and it came out about 2005. It's a pretty good movie. Well, his son, who's pictured in that picture, is a man by the name of Steve Saint. See, Steve Saint is a great picture of the, of the Samaritan. He was hurt and wounded by somebody. Specifically, these people, just like the Samaritan wasn't hurt by Gentiles, he wasn't hurt by the Romans, he was hurt by Jews. And here he has this opportunity, this, these people that killed his father, his aunt Rachel started going back and eventually his mom went with him and they had inroads into this tribe that murdered his father. And eventually, so many people in that tribe came to know Christ. And Steve Saint kind of grew up in that tribe. And he became a missionary himself back to that group. And you see one of the men that he's pictured there with? That man kind of became sort of like a, an adopted second father. I've had the great pleasure of having so many people that I can look at and many of them have gone home to be with the Lord. It breaks my heart, but be able to say, you're like a dad to me. It is amazing when you lose somebody that God brings someone in to fill that vacuum. And there's a man right there that he would call a father. And I was at a concert, I believe it was Stephen Kirsch Chapman a long time ago, and he told this story of Nate Saint and Steve Saint. And Steve Saint came out and started talking about how his father had a burden and how he then had a burden to go and to share Jesus with this tribe. And he had this James gentleman walked out on the, the stage with him. And then he begins to explain that the man who killed my father is this man. I don't know any other explanation than that, than that's Jesus. I don't know any better picture of the Good Samaritan story than that, where someone who has wronged you and hurt you and damaged you and hurt your soul, and you were able to turn around and give them mercy and love and give them Jesus and be able to take what was done to you. What, what Satan intended for evil, God turned around and made it into amazing ministry. If you are available, if you will say yes to the Lord, God will bring people for you to minister and to help. And in so doing, you will probably help yourself the greatest. Because probably no one would blame Steve Saint if he turned out to be a drunk. Probably no one would blame him if he hated those people and wanted nothing for them to get justice and have them wiped out. Or at least no one ever tell them about Jesus because they deserve hell. They deserve a separation from God for all eternity. No one on human logic would ever look at him and say, we don't blame you. We would join in your outrage. We join you in your hate. That is the natural human reaction. But the Jesus reaction is the reaction of the good Samaritan and to take mercy and to take love that's been given to you and give it to someone else. That is the message and the meaning of the good Samaritan.
Go and do thou likewise. Because you never know. It might just be you that gets the greatest healing of all. Every head bowed and every eye